Okay, hello everybody, and uh, nice to be see you, and nice to be here. Um, I'm going to give a sort of in, an introductory lecture to this course uh, on the topic of risk assessment in water management, which is an extremely huge topic, I can assure you. So what I'm going to say will just be sort of scratching the surface a little bit. Uh, I am professor in engineering geology at Chalmers University of Technology, and I'm head of uh, the research group in engineering geology, and I will talk a little bit about what the research group is doing, and then I will go into some basic concepts of risk, and I understand that you have a very, very different backgrounds in risk, uh, and then I'm going to show you just one example of things that of a risk assessment that we do. We, we are at uh, an engineering school or a technical university, so we do very much applied research. Of course, we do theoretical uh, research and development, but it's always with a, a, a practical sort of purpose that these methods that we develop, these theories that we develop are going to be somehow applied in practice. Uh, so uh, the engineering geology research group that I'm responsible for, uh, we have four different topic areas that we work on. We work on drinking water, and I was part of starting what is called Drix in Swedish, tip <laughs> in English, no, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a drinking water center. Uh, and actually, we're, we're the largest center for drinking water research in, in Sweden now. And we have, uh, we have Lund University, Lund uh, Technical University is part of it, together with Uppsala University. Uh, and um, we are about 25 researchers and PhD students doing drinking water research. And risk assessment is one important part of that center. Uh, also, many years ago, we started another competence center at Chalmers, uh, which is the Forum for Risk Investigation and Sustainable Technology, very much directed at cleaning up contaminated sites. And also in that area, risk assessment and risk management is a very, very important part. Uh, we also happen to work with uh, risk assessment on shipwrecks and munitions, which is not that we have uh, any basic understanding of from our research group, but we collaborate with uh, the maritime sciences at Chalmers University and uh, a number of external partners uh, with within uh, right now one EU project, but we've had several uh, EU projects uh, in, in, in the previous years on this. And uh, it's about uh, old shipwrecks uh, from the early 1900s and up till now, leaking oil and other contaminants. And also, the latest project that we worked on is uh, about munitions. After the World War II especially, a lot of munitions were dumped in the Baltic and also here on the west coast, outside the west coast of Sweden. And uh, these uh, substances are causing, potentially causing uh, quite much damage to the environment. And finally, the fourth leg that we have is hydrogeological risk assessment, where we look at uh, underground constructions and uh, problems with subsidence, which is a big uh, issue here in Gothenburg, in Stockholm, and other cities where there's a lot of underground constructions with my which might uh, uh, impact the uh, hydraulic properties of the ground and we may get, may get settlements and dam damages on buildings and underground install installations. And of course, risk assessment is uh, a key topic here. So uh, what we're doing in, 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 in my research group is, is very much risk assessment, and we work on, a, on, the, on, on, on different methods and approaches uh, uh, for this. And uh, when you work on risk, of course, you uh, start asking what can we do 
about the risk? How can we control the risk? How can we most efficiently uh, handle a risk situation, Re reduce the risks if, it w if, if we need to, but to what extent do we need to reduce the risk and so forth? So decision support connected to risk assessment is of course uh, uh, a key issue as well. So cost-benefit analysis, multi-criteria analysis, especially with a, with, a, with a connection to sustainability assessment and uh, things like value of information analysis. I don't know if you're going to talk about that <laughs> in the course. Good, yeah, I'm not going to say any more about that, but that's, that's one important thing that we work on. So we have uh, about 20 people today and uh, myself, two associate professors, uh, two junior researchers, uh, one old professor emeritus, <laughs> uh, two adjunct professors, two postdocs, and then nine PhD students. And we have a number of sort of uh, collaborate co uh, collaborators, associate researchers that we, 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 I could list many, many more, but, but we, so, so that's, that's, that's very shortly about the group. So why do we bother about risk? Why do you bother about risk? <coughs> oh, you can Google and find a lot of different statements like this, but I think this was, uh, was pretty good. Almost everything worthwhile carries with it some sort of risk, whether it's starting a new business, whether it's leaving home, whether it's getting married, or whether it's flying in space. So we, everything we do is associated with some kind of risk. And risk might be a negative word to many people, but risk also provides, risk assessment also provides opportunities. And uh, why do we, we, we face risks, we, can, we, we can't get away from it, but we need to manage that situation somehow. And why risk management? Well, it's to control, prevent or reduce the loss of life, illness or injury, damage of property and consequential loss, environmental impact. Uh, it's about being preventive rather than, rather than reactive, uh, facilitate rational decision making. I'm, I'm, I know you're going to talk about rational and decision making and that we may not be that rational all <laughs> when we make decisions. But um, uh, distinguish greater risk from lesser ones, provide transparency and as I say, very important to create opportunities because if we're good at managing risks, we also will find opportunities. So very many successful businesses, for example, are very good at managing risks. And uh, increase awareness and knowledge regarding issues, risk issues. I think there's uh, so much to do there. And uh, also to, to support risk communication. We all, I think, need to be better at communicating risk. It's one of the most important things to communicate. And that's, that's, that's very important. So what is risk? Well, uh, there are many different uh, definitions. One is by Bergman 2005, which I think is, has gained some uh, importance. The chance within a gi given time frame of an adverse uh, event with specific consequences. This is very, very much used and, and, and uh, seen in engineering uh, applications. A combination of the probability and the consequence. Kaplan and Gehrig's classic work from 1981. What can happen? How likely is it? What are the consequences? Which are key questions to be asked. Uh, uncertainty about the world. <laughs> Arvind, I don't know. Are you going to read Arvind's work in this course? A little bit, yeah. He has a lot of ideas and ri writes a lot of papers uh, on the concept of risk and understanding risk and things like that. And uh, the latest I ISO, which is the effect of uncertainty on objectives, taking away not the sort of not not just focusing on the negative consequences, but uncertainty about what can happen. But there are many different definitions on risk. And I guess we use the definitions, we, we use all of them actually. We, ha we have a quite practical uh, approach to working on risk. So we, we, we tend to use different, different definitions in different projects. Uh, this is a very uh, typical conceptual model that we use in water risk uh, 
assessment and water risk management. We have a problem and we have someone being exposed to that problem. And then in order to have a risk, we have to have some connection between the source and the receptor. This is called the source pathway receptor concept. And it tells us that we can work different strategies to reduce the risk. We can work on reducing the source. We can work on protecting the receptor. We can work on cutting off or reducing the pathways in between. Or you can work on combinations. But this conceptual sort of thinking is very much uh, a basis or a basic thing that we, we, we have and that we use. So if we look at the drinking water system, for example, where we have a source for drinking water, we have water treatment plants, we have reservoirs, we have pumping stations, we have a network, we have a distribution, uh, I mean a distribution network, and we have households, and within the, in the, those households we have humans. We have to be able to handle uh, in, in some sense and look at the total, the full chain of events from source to tap. And of course the basic, uh, uh, inf uh, basic understanding of the natural system is extremely important as well as the engineering or technical system. So a lot of challenges, really, it can be really, really complicated working on risk assessment in water as well as in all other fields when you get down to it, when you look into the details. But I'm just giving you the sort of conceptual uh, uh, model or understanding of, of a uh, water supply situation. Uh, so, uncertainty is a key issue in this course. What uncertainties are we looking at? Well, we look at parameter uncertainties. The uncertainty about the true value of a parameter in a mathematical model, like hydraulic conductivity, that's the perme permeability of the ground, essentially. Or the mean concentration of things, that might be threatening the water system, or uh, how efficient our uh, cleaning system, treatment system is, um, or statistical parameters, standard deviation of water loss in pipings, for example. These are parameters that we want to know in order to do our risk assessment, but we may be uncertain about those parameters. And I would say that that type of uncertainty is very much uh, focused on in our research and in many others' research, parameter uncertainty. What is much less focused on, what is more, much more difficult to handle is the parameter, uh, the model uncertainty. The uncertainty about the truth of the model, the predictive quality of the model, the accuracy of the quantitative microbial risk assessment model that predicts infection uh, probability, for example. Because wh why, is this, uh, why is this not so much focused on? Because it's time consuming and very challenging to set up different types of models or different models and evaluate the difference in outcomes of these models. So we tend to focus on this and we're not as good on this. Other types of uncertain, other, other categorization of uncertainty is what I think some of you are, are aware of, you know, you're gonna focus on or talk about in the course a little bit. Um, uncertainty due to the natural variability, which is called aleatory uncertainty. Alia, alia uh, tory uncertainty as relates to throw of the dice. That's natural. Uh, flow variability, heterogeneous hydraulic conductivity in the ground, contaminant concentrations in the soil, uh, con 
uh, organic content, for example, in raw water. Those we, that's what it is. We can't do anything about it. It varies in space and it varies in time. And uh, it cannot be reduced by measurements. For example, the spatial variability of dioxin in soil across an area. It is what it is. It varies. But we have also what is called the epistemic uncertainty, which is due to lack of knowledge. We, have, we may have a si limited sample of the population in an incomplete knowledge of transport processes through the system. This can be reduced by measurements. For example, the sample mean of the dioxin in that area. We can take more samples and be more sure about the sample mean. But we cannot reduce the, the spatial variability of that, of the, of the dioxin. So these are some examples on categorize, uh, categorization of uncertainties that we are working quite much on. And assessing or how to assess probability, we have to be able to handle different approaches. I'm sure some of you have, have, have taken courses in statistics. I, I thought statistics was a, was a boring subject when I took my courses. I didn't know what, what, what I'm going to do with this. But once I learned, uh, started working on risk, it became much more interesting because suddenly I found a reason <laughs> for the statistics courses and the, the, the knowledge. But uh, we work on both frequency and Bayesian methods. And uh, not without going into detail on this, but the statistical, or the frequentist uh, philosophy or approach is that there is a known probability uh, that can be found. Uh, we can express that probability with some confidence limits. Like for example, throw of a dice or how many times do we have accident spills at purification plants, wastewater treatment plants, and so forth. We can measure things and, uh, and calculate a frequency-based probability. But the other uh, philosophy uh, is that probability is unknown. It's a degree of del belief thing. We can, we can it's, 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 it's subjective. And this has gained a lot of interest and use in risk assessment and it's very, very useful. And some risk assessment methods are actually totally based on this philosophy. You can't do it with frequentist, the frequentist approach. So we've, we're quite much into Bayesian <laughs> methods. Um, and um, I, what, what we also need to do with these, with working with uncertainties and ex uh, expressing uncertainties is of course to, to look at uncertainties of different parameters uh, in models and doing uncertainty analysis and sensitivity analysis. And those two types of analysis should not be confused. They're different things. So an uncertainty analysis is about expressing and anal analyzing the uns total uncertainty of in, uh, the uncertainty of input variables in a model, whereas the sensitivity analysis is about tracing back, for example, how much how much contribution to the total uncertainty do we get from this parameter, from this parameter, from that parameter, and why is that important? Well, from a practical sense, when you do a risk assessment or a decision analysis, it gives you and it gives the uh, user of those results uh, some knowledge and information of where to look, what parameters, what uh, information to gather in order to get a more reliable or less uncertain risk assessment in the end, or decision, anal deci decision analysis outcome in the end. So it's about prioritizing uh, resources for further studies. So sensitivity analysis is something that we're looking quite much into, of course. Uh, Approaches to 
risk and risk quantification. I give, I, I'm just going to very briefly uh, show something that Arvin, Terry Arvin wrote. Um, this is a simple logic tree, and you're all aware of that. And uh, we have an initiating event, and uh, we have different outcomes. And for example, we may be interested in calculating the probability of <coughs> y equals 2. And we set up this equation. And we can do that uh, with uh, looking into the frequency of this and the probabilities of uh, A and the probability of B given A. And uh, Oven writes about different approaches to doing this, and we have the classical uh, approach, the classic approach, where we look uh, for best estimates of this risk. We have, but that has that 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 has sort of developed into what is called a more probabilistic approach of risk assessment, where. This, where we try to put, and uh, where we try to put uh, and assess uncertainties about this risk calculation, and so the classic approach, including uncertainty analysis, is one way of doing it. Trying to put uncertainties on both probabilities and the consequences or the outcomes of that risk calculation. And then, what is the recommended approach by Arven is that we should not focus so much on the uncertainty of the probabilities. Because if the probabilities are subjective, there is really not much uncertainty to those probabilities. And uh, I'm not the one to judge which approach is the best appro approach on this. Uh, but we're working on <laughs> both of them. Sometimes we put uncertainties on both uh, probabilities, actually, depending on how certain that, that probability estimation is, and on the consequences of the risk calculation. And sometimes we will focus much more on just the probabilities of the, of the consequences. But anyway, uh, I think it's important to read that kind of literature and try to figure out what do these uh, authors like Arvin and others mean when they write about risk and probability in a more philosophical context. Because it gives you a way uh, to reflect on different aspects of risk and uncertainty. Because this is a topic where there, there, there are really a lot of different uh, interpretations about risk and uncertainties. Yeah. yeah so Please interrupt. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious to understand yeah. the, the difference between these three. Mm. So in the in the left one, mm -hmm. one is basically trying to make as good estimate as possible yeah. of the parameters, yeah. the probabilities, and then you just calculate what you yeah. is. Yeah. And in the middle one, mm. you put uncertainty on your parameters yeah. and then you propagate to the model mm. and then you get uncertainty about the risk. Yeah. And the third one mm. you are I mean how do you get that? You're just you're just describing uncertainty in what could happen. But uh, you, in order uh, yeah. to do that yeah. you need to express yeah. uncertainty in input. So yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think that what Arvin, uh, my interpretation is that he says that if you have a Bayesian approach where you have subjective uh, probability estimations, you should, n you should not really put uncertainty distributions about the probabilities that you, you, you're working on, but just looking at the sort of the, the observable quantities of the risk, what, what can be observed, what can be measured, that's what you should put uncertainty distributions on. Uh, this, uh, representing both the aleatory and the uh, epistemic uh, uncertainties. 
that's his line of thinking. So I can, with my experience at least, I can see that in some projects you need to do the, have this approach and in some projects you have to do that approach. But it, it, it's, it's very important to describe how you think about risk. What do you mean about, uh, with, how do you define risk? How do you do your calculations? And, and be very, very clear about that. Because, um, yeah, it, it's really, really important. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, so what have we done? We have done so many projects on risk and risk calculations. For example, we've worked with uh, the city of Gothenburg for many years. We set up a, a gig gigantic fault tree model for the entire uh, drinking water system in Gothenburg <coughs> and calculated the uh, water supply safety in terms of customer minutes lost for the average consumer in Gothenburg. And the, the system that was previously, uh, uh, hey, uh, the, that the system, the previous system up till a few years did not by far meet the goal of the city for providing a safe drinking water supply. There were too many interruptions and too many disturbances. And we could show the risk level in terms of customer minutes lost and you see the uncertainty distributions around that risk level expressed as a 5th and 95th percentile and the median. And also using that information, the probability that the target level could not be met. So what happened, it was a basis for the city to uh, invest 700 million Swedish kroner to upgrade the treatment plants and the distribution network to some extent so that now uh, the uh, goal of the water su supply safety uh, is more or less reached <laughs> by the city. So uh, that was one ex just an example of, of how to use a quite advanced uh, risk model with, with a lot of uh, focus on uncertainty assessment to provide a decision support for the city in, in Gothenburg. Uh, however, some many times, uh, often I would say risk is not a binary phenomenon. It's just like not just is that threshold uh, reached or not reached? Uh, so calculation of a total risk value of all over all possible ranges of consequences and probabilities is necessary. And also, risk is time dependent of, of quite often due to, for example, climate change or change in behavioral patterns of drink drinking water consumers and so forth. So we have a situation where we have different outcomes or different consequences occurring with different probabilities. Typically, a small or limited consequence can happen quite often. Few people in the drinking water example, for example, in Gothenburg, uh, quite, quite a limited amount of people will, um, it can happen quite often that they won't get water for a few hours due to breaks and pipe breaks and things like that. But as we go up here, uh, for example, uh, half of the city, it's a very, very low probability that the half of the city will, will, will have uh, a shortage of water. But the total risk is sort of the integral over all possible outcomes. And this, uh, this curve also changes over time. So it makes things quite quite complicated actually to take that in all these different outcomes and the time dependency into consideration. I worked on this together with the city of Gothenburg quite much on damage costs due to flood, uh, uh, calculating damage costs due to flooding in the city. And there is, in that situation we have a very um, clear uh, climate effect dependency on 
the, the progression of risk over time. So it's about doing this, but doing this with a time uh, dependency, where the, f the, the probabilities of flooding to different levels will change over time. It's the same in drinking water, because we have changes in water quality, we have ch uh, due to climate change, we have changes in, in demand for water and so forth. So we typically face time dependency uh, and uncertainty about time dependency quite much in our modeling work. Just Lars, yeah? what happens in alternative two there? That's a big uh, difference. Yeah, uh, this, is, uh, this is then put into a cost-benefit analysis. I'm not going to show you every <laughs> all these things, but we have an initial risk if we don't do anything, and then we have different protection alternatives. So this is uh, a very far-reaching protection alternative with a very high barrier for that particular error. Then you take away the risk, essentially. But probably that's due to a, that's associated with much higher cost than these others. Yeah. The yeah. The yeah. 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 Mm. This is just an example. So uh, we're we're very much into do <laughs> these types of calculations, but we're also very much into trying to put consequences and v evaluate, uh, assess consequences for these outcomes. And in a water context, these consequences can be with respect to both human impacts, to ecological impacts, and economic impacts. And um, humans, for example, we have d disease and disability, and we worked quite much with health economists at the Solgrenska uh, on that. We uh, have uh, here, on the ecological side, functionality of organisms and uh, genetic variability within and between populations, which is typical to take into consideration when you work on contaminated sites and the remediation of those sites. Also, with respect to the shipwrecks and the munitions, we are very much looking into this. And perhaps what we've worked most on <laughs> is try to put values on this in collaboration with environmental economists. Uh, to look at uh, valuing ecosystem services, health impacts, for example, and uh, also project uh, consequences like delays and replacing of components and so forth. Uh, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> many things to think about on, the, on that side of the risk coin. So, Another thing that I think also perhaps will be talking about is that no matter how good you are at setting up your uh, quantitative or your model for doing the, your risk calculation, no matter how good you are at uncertainty assessment, no good at how you are at, at uh, uh, assessing the consequences, we have to realize that people in the end also perceive risks very much very differently. It's very different if you're exposed to the risk or if you're benefiting from the activity that is creating the risk, for example. And then you're, uh, you have the decision makers who may be politicians and other people thinking about getting re-elected or <laughs> about you know, not having a specific budget to spend and so forth. So, uh, but from an Individu individual perspective, um, we there are typically a number of different issues that are listed like these on how we perceive risk. And uh, it's, for example, if we have control, we may not think that, we, if you think we have control, like driving a car, we uh, think that that risk is not that high. But if we don't have control, like flying an airplane, we think that it would be much better if I was the pilot myself because I could have control of the airplane. Uh, and that has nothing to do with the real risk because it's so much safer to fly than to drive a car. 
so different factors affect how we perceive risks and uh, in some situations we are risk averse we are ca uh, careful some in some situations but quite quite difficult to think of very many situations where we are totally risk neutral actually and many people are very risk seeking every time you you buy a, lo uh, a lottery ticket or or uh, uh, riding your motorcycle or whatever you're actually not <laughs> perhaps <laughs> uh, looking that neutrally on risk so uh, that is a very very important s uh, a part of, r of risk s assessment and risk management also in the water sector and I would say that that this is something we we should uh, develop uh, in our research uh, more so uh, what do we mean by managing risks then um, it's about identifying the problem and uh, uh, modeling it's an iterative process continuous mo update of models and estimates and no strict boundaries between the different steps in risk management and be aware that terminology may differ and there are different methods and, and tools that can be applied but it's important to have some kind of framework to think about and to, to have a conceptual uh, model for, for what, what is risk management and this is the ISO model that you may all be aware of where you have a risk assessment step including identification analysis and evaluation of risks and uh, you have this as an iterative process uh, leading to a basis for treatment of risks and we often put up the framework like this where we have a decision problems problem and we want to reach a decision in the end and how to do that then risk management comes in with a risk assessment part where we have an analysis of risks about defining the scope identifying the hazards estimating the risks and then evaluating the risks what is tolerable and what alternatives do we have to reduce the risk and how can we do that in the best way and here we have the decision support methods coming into play like cost benefit analysis multi criteria analysis and so forth and that might lead to a basis or support for decisions but we have to be aware that we as experts are doing the assessment and the analysis but there are managers that review and use this and it's done in a framework or in a context where we have norms values and preferences goals uh, in regulations and preferences among people and so forth so we cannot really come up with any type of decision alternative here we have to use and come up and analy analyze decision alternatives that are in line with the goals preferences uh, of in society and uh, uh, this also has to be done in an iterative way and I know that this type of describing risk management is very theoretical and I idealized but somehow this is important to understand that we are working in risk is part of the bigger picture uh, so for example you're very welcome to the, la the, the next PhD presentation in our group which is Victor who's going to present his work on drinking water where he has done and worked according to this risk management framework from source to tap looking into microbial risk assessment source characterization modeling of contaminant transport and then a dose response assessment and you with respect to to health exposure exposure to health of microbial contaminants in drinking water and valuation of risks using a cost-benefit approach 
to provide decision support. And he's worked for the, some of you are from Malmö, with the VOMB <laughs> water supply, which you may know that you get the water, drinking water from the VOMB area, supplying southwest Skåne with, with drinking water. I think it's a, it's a nice piece of work he's, he's, he's done, where he's actually been able to uh, work according to this idealized, idealized risk management framework quite much. So I'm going to end just a few. Can I have five more minutes? Yeah. Uh, on uh, a project that we've worked on for some time and uh, which we will continue to work on for another year. It's about what is called artificial groundwater recharge in Africa, in Botswana. Uh, where we've done a quite advanced modeling, uh, risk modeling, uh, for, for coming up with decision support on, on whether it's worthwhile to take surface water, which is scarce in Botswana, and infiltrate it into the ground in order to store it in the ground until the water is needed, and in order to reduce the loss of water due to transpiration. So Botswana is a country in southern Africa and if uh, you haven't been there I recommend everyone to go there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fascinating country uh, by many ways. That's fascinating history. But it, uh, just two million people, uh, 1.5 times larger than uh, the size of Sweden uh, and the Kalahari Desert covers a lo large portion of the country and it's a former British protectorate but no one was really in interested in, in Botswana because it's just desert until diamonds were found. But then they were their own country. So they haven't been colonized in, 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 in the same way as other southern African countries. Uh, they have diamonds and they have fi five million cattle. So they, and they're they eat, 90% of the food is meat. <laughs> so it's not for vegetarians. Uh, fast growing economy, but they ha used to have the second highest HIV infection rate in the world. <coughs> and their uh, life expectancy was down to 33 years, about 15 years ago. I think it now it's almost 60, so a lot of improvements. Um, uh, and significant drop in HIV and AIDS due to free medication programs. Uh, but with this comes an in ever increasing water demand. You see the curve here from 2006 until 2035 and the following that very steep increasing demand curve for water, water use in, in, in the country. So uh, water sc scarcity is a major challenge uh, it affects health, opportunities, economy, gender equality, and so forth in the country. It's, it's really uh, an important part for Botswana as a country and as a the, the possibilities to develop. And the situation is that it's, it's a low rainfall and high rates of potential evapotranspiration. That, it, that means total uh, total transpiration. There are some rivers in the north, but they're so far away from where people live and uh, that it's, it's not possible to transfer water from that area. And there are no other perennial streams. And the natural groundwater recharge is zero to one millimeter per year. And the potential evapotranspiration, the total transpiration is 2,800 millimeters per year. So they lose about 70% of all the water that they collect in dams. So uh, eastern Botswana here is the most, so here are the perennial rivers, but down here is where people live. And they have a large water distribution network connecting groundwater wells and surface water dams. Quite often the dams look like this because the water is just gone. And so the idea is to take water and infiltrate it into the ground in deep wells to store it and then use it when necessary. 
And how does this affect the total water supply safety for the country? We, our study is about looking at holistically at eastern Botswana and put assess the potential for using this type of storage of water. And it's a collaboration between us, the Department of Water Affairs and the Water Utilities Corporation, and we also had funding from CEDA, but not anymore, so now it's, it's the World Bank uh, financing this project. And what we did, more technically, is to set up the entire distribution system like this. There's a 350 kilometer long pipeline connecting different cities and small villages uh, as demand centers and then there are surface water dams and groundwater well fields connected to this distribution network. And the big user of course is this the capital down here. But there are other demand centers. So what we did was to set up a model, a risk model for this. And I'm sure you're going to talk about, you're aware of Monte Carlo simulations? You're going to talk about that? Yeah. It's about when you have uncertainties for different input parameters and you want to calculate the total uncertainty. You run the model many, many times and you sample from these input variables and you get a distribution also for the total outcome, the uncertainty of the outcome. So we, it was about looking at the, uh, the water balance for dams uh, with respect to a number of different things, a number of different properties in the, in the, in the model, in the, in the system, and also the demand for water and uh, the groundwater aquifers, the well fields. So we used historical data on annual inflows to the dams and we came up with a way to produce time based on time series measurements of inflows of these dams to create time series for the future, keeping the statistical properties and then generating a lot of possible future inflows and outflows of these dams and working in that into the, the model of the total system. Uh, so we had to find information about a number of things and you'd be surprised of how mu much they've measured over the years. And for the same thing for the well fields, for the groundwater aquifers. So we initiated different modeling uh, th uh, operations and also pr predict predictions of demand data and what we came up with was a model output where we can see the probability of shortage the magnitude of shortage over t over time this I'm, ju I'm just gonna end up here pretty soon uh, this these are measured historical data and they actually have 80 year measurements of the streams in the country in that area. So we had to look at different uh, rivers, not perennial rivers, but streams where there is occasional flow of water and inflow to different dams. And we have to take into consideration the correlations because we cannot just independently model these things. These all are connected in some way. So we what we did was that we took and produced the five-dimensional time series modeled as first order stationary Gaussian autoregressive uh, sequences and read up to 2035 and uh, we came based on the statistics uh, from these mm, historical data we came up with future model inflows to these, to these dams. And I'm, I, I know you, can, you cannot follow in all the <laughs> details here, <laughs> but it's essentially about looking at the statistical data, keeping the statistical properties, and simulating future scenarios. So uh, this is the basic equation for, for, for what storage is available, actually. And I, I skipped that. And we developed a tool so that the uh, water... Uh, authority can, can, 
can uh, model uh, different types of different scenarios, different usages diff for different demand centers in this model. And I'm just going to show you the outcome of three things. The current system, as it was in year 2013, if we don't do anything, if we install this Decathlon dam, which was actually installed after, after the first part of our study, and then the dam in, con in connection with also using the well fields at this Pala Road site and at the Masama area, using uh, uh, managed aquifer recharge uh, at these well fields. And uh, if we don't do anything, there will be 70% of the months up till 2035 will have some shortage at some place in the system. And 48% of this deficit is uh, given uh, is because of shorter, is water shortage in Gaborone. Almost all demand centers will be effective and problems are likely to start early during the simulation period. Actually, the last time I was there two years ago, there was no water in the capital for and hadn't been for three months. So what we could do then is to look at all the future years and see if we have scenario A, different, different levels of water shortages, and uh, what will happen if we install the dam, and what will happen if we install also the well fields. So you can see that the risk of problem will significantly decrease. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, dependent on eliminating some limiting factors that have to do with, with uh, water treatment capacities and, and things like that, and that was taken into consideration as well. So the final outcome of this is that if we don't do nothing, we have this situation, if we just include the dam, we will still have significant probabilities of problem and shortages if we do it this instu install the well field and the managed aquifer recharge we will reduce the uh, problem significantly and if we also can take away these limiting factors we will get down to reasonably low uh, uh, probabilities for problems so I'm going to end here. What's happened is that we're now starting a new phase of the project where we're actually going to build a, a project uh, or a pilot study facility for doing that, that infiltration and testing that infiltration. And I can also tell that we've re long before this I was involved in Namibia, in Windhoek, in the capital for installing the same kind of method and system and not based on a, this advanced risk assessment but that, was, that has been operating for 15 years now and uh, contributed to, to the water supply for that, for that city quite well. I'm sorry I took more time than I expected to but this was just, I know too many details perhaps but this is just an overview of what and some example of what we're doing on water risk management. Okay, thank, thank you. you.